do, do you hear me or the connection is lost? No, we can see you, but we can hear you, but we can see you. Hello? Yes, we say that we can hear you, but we can see you. Miteka, your, uh, your video is not visible. Miteka? I guess it's working now, right? Yeah. Yeah, sorry for that. Internet connection is becoming a bit of a problem these days. <laughs> Okay. Uh, is it 12? Everybody is in already, right? Uh, Roshan, we can start, right? Already, everybody joined. Hello. Excellent. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. He's here. Excellent. So, start. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, uh, depending on where are you in different parts of the world. Uh, we're very pleased today uh, to join series of the panel discussions organized by the Nizami Kanjavi Center and then by the foundation of Mariana Bardonianis on the anniversary of the 75th anniversary of the UN and the title of this series of the panel discussions in itself is quite indicative I would say of where we are globally as humanity it's the juncture at which we see what the future for us all holds and how much are we able to shape it. Uh, Unmute, uh, do I have to click? <laughs> Sorry, no, we do with the technology. Sorry. Are we all set logistically so that we do hear each other and then, yeah, great. Voice if it's possible, whoever is not speaking, just unmute, but not to have additional voices. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, to go uh, for a few uh, logistical details, perhaps, we have, um, we're fortunate to have a lineup of great speakers, uh, which uh, come uh, with ample experience world and globally as well. And uh, we would like uh, to have this opportunity shared in such a way that we could tap into that experience and have a possibility for the introductory remarks as well as Q&A session that could be preceded after that. So in terms of the uh, timing of our interventions, uh, we would appreciate, uh, and I would appreciate as a moderator, if uh, speakers could keep it up to five minutes or seven minutes as the introductions. And for our keynote speaker, we will have 10 minutes devoted to that. And I'm, I'll proceed with the uh, follow-up questions. And if there will be any questions that the Secretariat could supply to me as well, that we could receive from the chat rooms as well, we could be able to pick up on this as well. As you all know, the panel discussion is being uh, transmitted in live as well, so that we have opportunity for the lighter audiences to be part of it, not only through the Zoom uh, uh, meeting uh, entry possibilities, but uh, uh, to the live stream as well from the Facebook uh, page of the uh, Nizami Ganjavi Center. I will proceed with a very short introduction of our uh, speakers to the audience that is uh, watching us today. Uh, I have to say uh, for, for our viewers today that I will only be able to say few words on some of the former positions that and current engagement that our speakers do have because if I would spend time for all of what they have done throughout their uh, long and very 
productive career, it would have been uh, too much time that we would uh, spend on that. So I'll do very few remarks on our speakers so that you have an understanding uh, of who they are and then what is this uh, extensive experience that comes with them for today's panel discussion. We will be joined today as a keynote speaker by His Excellency Prince Hassan bin Talal of Jordan. Uh, and uh, we are very much looking forward to his introduction in the panel discussion. <clears throat> we'll have today with us uh, former Prime Minister of uh, Pakistan, Mr. Shuakad Aziz. Uh, Prime Minister of Norway uh, from 2001 to 2005, Mr. Bondovic. We will have uh, former President of Romania, Emil Constantinescu, uh, Minister of State of Belgium and Honorary Speaker of the House. We have uh, Mladen Ivanic, uh, Member of the Presidency of the Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Mrs. Anna Palacio, former Foreign Minister of Spain, um, Boris, and, but Boris Tadic for uh, President of Serbia be unable to join us today, but he was otherwise scheduled to be part of a uh, panel discussion for today. Uh, I will start with very few remarks uh, from my side as a moderator. I don't want to keep the audience uh, with, with, the, with the introduction that could long from my side, but I guess it is merited to point out that the theme of discussion for today is very large, if we speak about the future global governance and then the themes that have been identified as the main ones for today's discussion, which is what is the good governance, uh, how we could achieve uh, development of the kind that could be conducive to internal cohesion of our societies as much as, as, much as to the peace globally as well. Uh, then we are obviously touching a wide area and wide spectrum of the issues that are related to that. We see that in this very challenging times of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, how much not only human tragedies uh, have become of the forefront of the global news related to that, but then how much it highlighted vulnerabilities that we already faced. It magnified and amplified perhaps our understanding that action is needed now for us to be able to build the future that would be conducive to peace, to inclusiveness and then cohesion when it comes to what the social cohesion of our future societies could be. And in that regard, uh, we do have uh, an opportunity of approaching this issue from different angles. And I'm very glad that we have such a diversity of experiences from our speakers that could be of great use for us to discuss these issues. And uh, with that, uh, I will proceed uh, right away with giving the floor to His Excellency, uh, Prince uh, Hassan bin Talal of Jordan, uh, to start with the keynote uh, speak uh, introduction, speaking introduction of our panel discussion. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I just want to... Uh, um, greet all my colleagues uh, around this um, excellent colloquium and uh, to quote uh, going directly to the topic at hand global governance the rule of law and how wars can transit into peace to citing Halford Mackinder one of the founding fathers of geopolitics and geostrategy in 1904 he spoke of the theory of heartland his most famous quote was who rules, rules Eastern Europe commands the heartland. And in that sense, I'm deeply interested in the rehabilitation of four countries who became known as the Visegrad Four, with the, what one minister told me, the equivalent of uh, the investment of four Marshall plans. So clearly the West would like to see the heartland as a stable heartland. I'm also interested in the fact that General Mackenzie, who of course uh, commands CENTCOM, Central Command for the period, the Middle East, also is responsible for liaising with the four Central Asian republics. So the concept of Middle East is a flexible con concept. Uh, I was once told by a, a foreign diplomat, Middle East means from uh, Casablanca to uh, Bangladesh. And I, I, I would like to focus here on uh, the final statements of Makinda, who says, who rules the world island commands the world. I want to um, say very clearly that uh, in the case of our region, we are geopolitically a Mediterranean uh, country. At the same time, we have the 
Forum for the Eastern Mediterranean. We are sometimes referred to as the soft underbelly of NATO. And I recall in uh, 1994, 95, uh, in conjunction with Shimon Peres at the time, going to talk about establishing a world fund for encouraging the will to stay. In that context, we would have spoken of $35 million over a decade to be invested in encouraging the will of refugees from Morocco to Turkey to stay. Uh, arguably today, anti-terror and fanaticism is uh, the key to understanding security. Unfortunately, when we went to the European Union at that time, they said first come, first serve. And a few years later, after the Twin Towers, uh, uh, the uh, President of the United States signed off on homeland security, which I, I, ironically was the same 35 billion. Uh, Deauville process, of course, was the same 35 billion. So it's uh, very difficult to find money in an emergency. And I want to tell you today that 1% of uh, the population of planet Earth, according to Filippo Grande, is uh, our refugees. And up to 80% of those refugees are Muslims. So I would like to suggest that we, going back to the definitions of basic and current security, recognize that NPT, which of course has been uh, 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 an interest of mine, I've been a member of the NPT board for uh, several years with uh, uh, Sam Nunn and others. And I want to say that uh, NPT, as far as our region is uh, concerned, if we look at Morocco to um, Bangladesh, has at least three rogue players. Uh, Mavericks, Pakistan, India, and Israel. There we speak about Israel because in terms of our region, of course, Israel is a, a special status country and uh, uh, does not seem to apply to any uh, 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 concepts of intra-independence. And the glaring example of that is, of course, in the um, current move towards annexation to which I can return uh, if you <clears throat> wish me to. So I would suggest to you that in terms of uh, global governance, the 17 goals of uh, 2016 of the SDGs started with an end to hunger and ended with global partnership to achieve those goals. Today, we have uh, a, a, a remarkable increase of uh, hunger, the war on want, COVID, of course, has exacerbated the situation. It has upended many things, but it has certainly not up, up, upended the refugee question. And uh, the refugees are the first and the last to pay. And since 1949, and I hear we have to distinguish between ceasefire and peace. Since 1949, we have had the ceasefire with Israel. Every decade since then, we have had a war in the region. And of course, populism has uh, played a very important role as it does then. And uh, although we have peace treaties now in effect, we have not achieved just and uh, comprehensive peace for this region. So my first point is that uh, global commons should at least take into consideration that the absence of violence does not mean that the conditions of violence and, and, and conflict have gone. Far from it. I think that the people working on the development goals are all those UNGOs, INGOs, civil society, institutionless civil society who are working on the key existential issues. Whereas uh, the Security Council, may I pun, uh, while the world is in uh, lockdown, the Security Council is in deadlock. So in terms of giving those of us uh, the inspiration that we need, I think it is uh, absolutely imperative that the, we understand that the absence of violence, of course, is still better than violence, but we must be careful to ensure that it is not an end in itself, but a stage to real durable peace. A reduction in violence in the form of a ceasefire is a good stage for this. And of course, when I received the Good Friday Agreement uh, signatories to uh, share their experiences with us, I was uh, deeply moved by the fact that uh, they had achieved on the ground in Northern Ireland and, uh, of course, uh, in, in Lebanon, for example, uh, just to cite two examples. 
but the underlying sectarian tensions have not gone away. The underlying ethnic tensions have not gone away. And today we talk about this racism and discrimination and those underlying uh, uh, tensions are increasing as we speak in many parts of the world. The world must go on in bridging sectarian divides and in enabling dialogue. I received a, a, a message from Avi Schleim, the well-known uh, uh, professor at Oxford, uh, of course, uh, one of those um, keen historians of uh, uh, our region, and he refers to Churchill as Johnson's hero and role model, who personified the racism of the British ruling class of that era. This is what Churchill told the Peel Commission inquiry into the Arab revolt in Palestine in 1937. I do not agree that the dog in a manger has the final right to the manger. Even though he may have lain there for a long time, I do not admit that right. I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the Black people of Australia. I do not admit that the wrong has been done to those people by the fact that the stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race has come in and taken their place. So this statement is not only shocking, but also clearly underlines that racism goes hand in hand with colonialism, our uh, basic obsession with the other and uh, uh, the wrongs of the other. So we, I think we must be very careful in understanding what and where the violence is. And uh, just because wars was stop, stop, it doesn't mean that citizens stop experiencing violence. As for the rule of law, let me just comment that in the past uh, six or seven decades, the rule of law has ceased to be so much focused on in between states uh, uh, as it is now focused on uh, whatever uh, uh, happens to be the uh, uh, whimsical choice of the moment. And uh, I, I think that addressing maverick states has, uh, of course, uh, played an important role. Iraq and Afghanistan are the two most ex extreme examples. Wars officially ended many years ago, but the violence remains a daily reality. So the rule of law, the development of regional institutions, the development of civil society, and of course, you can cite many other examples, but in the form of extremist violence and kidnappings for economic and political re reasons and state violence, I would almost talk about uh, uh, pirate capitalism. It seems to me that we are living in a period of time that uh, might is right more than ever before. And in geopolitical terms, wars might end, but that's not always the experience of those on the ground. But I'd let, like to remind you that a dispute is a subject of content. It is not a subject of uh, make-believe. Yes, there, there is the, fate of the hatred and the anger and uh, the extreme passion. But once again, I would like to remind you that uh, in the 1980s, we did create a, an international commission for, at the request of the Secretary General of the UN to uh, bring about the uh, evolution of a universal humanitarian order. Parts of these uh, suggestions have been taken and cannibalized, for example, turning uh, UNRWA, the United Nations Disaster Relief Organization, into OSHA, the Office of the Commissioner for Humanitarian Affairs. And we recognize, of course, that there are small achievements on the policy side, but it's always the politics that seems to undermine us. And uh, I hope that we will not see in Syria exactly the same uh, when we speak about the win in name only of the present regime. The violence will continue unabated on different sides. Uh, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, by the way, Palestine and Jordan are also uh, that 70 million equivalent to the Visegrad Four. Our in income is uh, well below the $2,000 mark. Their income per capita is over 36,000. So whether we're talking about uh, Kurdish, Turkish, uh, um, in, in terms of people on the ground, or the interventions of others, whether Russian or American, everyone accuses everyone else of uh, working with proxies. The most glaring example of all this is uh, the current situation in the Yemen. I'm very happy to announce that 
after our appeal for the Yemen, I was able to establish some contact with the Kuwait hospital by name in uh, Sana'a to help Yemenis with the protocols of the COVID uh, uh, application in Jordan, which they considered to be successful. And the foreign diplomat said to me, but Sana'a is under Houthi control. I said, that's not my affair. That's a political affair. I'm interested in the humanitarian context. Whose control it is doesn't make it any better. What will the UN call this situation, whether in Iraq or in Libya or uh, uh, Yemen? It is not civil war. The government is waging war on its own people, but how do we make peace out of this? So I would suggest that maybe to go, to continue every Friday, for Friday after over nine years, uh, suggesting that uh, the obstacle to the peace is uh, uh, that uh, uh, is that basically that we should allow the uh, authoritarian rule to win on his own terms. And I don't need to name other uh, other uh, names of authoritarian leaders. Gaining control of the whole country, uh, I, I, I think that this is uh, the double standard. Once again, the hypocrisy to which. Uh, Pope Francis alluded a few days ago in June between talking about the war on hunger and continuing to manufacture weapons. When will this uh, uh, evolve uh, and where will it go? Um, I think acquiescing, not only acquiescing, but actually promoting the Ill illegal annexation of Palestinian lands, military annexation, sends a shudder, surely, through those who seek a more peaceful world. The rule of law, which is preached as a central feature of uh, the uh, civil, civilized relationship between us, not the clash of civilizations, but the clash of culture, rejects the concept of a diktat by this power group or that power group. And uh, I just hope that uh, you, uh, all of you, will help us to preach truth to power. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Let me follow up with uh, one question to you. Um, violence, sectarian violence, all the underlying causes that have prompted uh, conflict and destabilization in so many parts of the world, including in Middle East that you have mentioned uh, eloquently, um, they remain to be valid. Uh, unfortunately, not that much changed in most of the regions in that regard and in the countries, including in Eastern Europe, from where I come from in that regard. Do you see anything is changing now so that one could expect more of uh, leadership when it comes to the leadership at the global level that is needed to unclog a situation and then lead to more sustainable peace? Or we are entering in a more challenging era where a situation could get even worse with uh, more of inner looking approach in many powerful developed countries that we see now due to the internal political situations. What we should expect, worsening of the situation in the short term at least, or maybe perhaps more of strategic foresight that could emerge out of the crisis in which we are now? I would answer you by saying that leadership from beyond the region usually acts as a, sometimes acts as a stimulus when it's a question of a coalition for war against this or that but often act as a veto in terms of uh, the movement toward the institution building and civil society, which would make this possible. I mean, the, 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 the recent peace plan, the US peace plan known as the vision, was released at a period of time, the dynam dynamics between and within Israel, you're speaking of leadership, today there are thousands demonstrating in Tel Aviv, Palestine and the international community have been changing. Divides between Israeli and Palestinian publics are deepening, uh, making the Arabic language a second rate language to uh, the dominance of Hebrew, for example, has not helped. Public and diplomatic debates on the future of Palestinian statehood are varying. The humanitarian and political crisis crisis in Gaza is growing rapidly and we're told Gaza will become a part of the new state. So I would like to say that leadership has meant in track one, which means uh, directly responsible uh, 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 
uh, people speaking to each other. I don't see much track one at the present time. Maybe COVID hasn't helped because people have to communicate uh, long distance. But uh, the fact is that uh, official diplomacy, maybe we, maybe we need a, 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 diplo a, a diplomacy um, uh, assistance fund or a promotion fund to, to develop track one and track two and make the uh, connection between the two because it is in track two where I have worked for much of my life where the vision is important. I don't think you can develop much by just talking about projects for, in the, for example in this region. We need a vision of, uh, you said Eastern Europe, a Rhine Commission, a Danube Commission, a Jordan Valley Commission which is above politics, above sticky fingers, if that's possible in today's world, and which can work for the generalized uh, uh, well-being of peoples, regardless of whether they're refugees or, or nationals, refugees on Mars and uh, nationals on Venus, as my friend Peter Sutherland used to say. If we're going to convince people, uh, meaning a generalized uh, reference to the predominance of the young and of women, they are the future, but we have to talk about not only enabling, which may sound patronizing, but also entrustment as we move from humiliation to dignity. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, 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 um, it's been uh, frustrating to watch uh, uh, inability of the Security Council lately to act on the appeal of the Secretary General for the ceasefire year, at least. I fully agree with you when you mentioned that absence of violence and ceasefire itself is not an, an end in itself when we speak about the conflict. But even that, at the, at the midst of the pandemic, was unfortunately unachievable so that the seizing of the hostilities could have allowed for more humanitarian action in conflict-driven areas. So let's hope that more of the leadership at the, the international level could emerge <laughs> that could lead to, to, to better solutions. I will turn now to Prime Minister of, uh, former Prime Minister of Pakistan, uh, Mr. Shuakad Aziz. Uh, the floor is yours uh, for your introduction. Uh, you need to unmute the microphone. <laughs> Did I not mute my microphone? <laughs> it's like too complicated because every time the Zoom is upgrading itself, updating, you, you really like, you know, confusing to find out ways like, you know, a mute or way to stop recording. Do you hear me? Yes, very clearly, thank you. We see you very clearly. Sorry for this uh, little technolo technology slip here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you through this very effective means of communication, which we are all using today. Uh, today, as I talk about the UN very briefly, I am reminded of a great leader who I had the privilege of working with for uh, uh, effort to reorganize or restructure and relook at the UN. It was Secretary General Kofi Annan who got a group of government people together from around the world. And that's when I really delved in coming from the private sector it was I learned a lot in that process. But I could say very before I read my prepared remarks, that the UN at that time needed a lot of reform and a lot was done. And I think today it needs it even more. Having said that, let me, ladies and gentlemen, say that it is an honor for me to be invited here today uh, to take a look at a shared future at the 75th anniversary since the United Nations was founded. Then countries were, were emerging from devastation of a world war their populations and economies were decimated. The United Nations 
was found out of a recognition that global cooperation was needed, that no country could tackle its challenges in isolation. Today, we are dealing with a new crisis, which has spread all over the world, and it needs all of us to work together. This pandemic, this pandemic does not recognize borders. It does not distinguish between developed and developing countries. All countries are having to grapple with this new enemy, and many are struggling. Above all, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we have a global need to work together, to share our resources and our knowledge, sharing medical equipment and expertise and other areas of cooperation, which will be needed going forward. Ladies and gentlemen, before we discuss in more detail the United Nations and other global institutions, let me say a few words about the universal principles of governance. I believe good countries, however developed they are, should abide by the following principles. Reform should be a continuous process. No one is exempt from reform and it is something which we need to do on an ongoing basis. During my time in government as Prime Minister of Pakistan, I carried out three, a three-pronged program which had wide region, region structural reforms as part of the reform. These were, can be summarized in three words, privatization, deregulation, and liberalization. Maybe because I was a banker, I focused on the economic aspects. Um, but we, it was much more holistic than what I've just said. Of, uh, so we did the reforms, and one of the objectives of all this effort was to get transparency at all levels in government, accountability at all levels in government, and increase the level of professionalization as we went along. Which brings me to my next point. Many countries have aspirations to influence global affairs, and a crisis such as COVID-19 can provide them with an opportunity to make a difference. But in order to really emerge as a world power, aspirations are not enough. You also need to accept with influence comes responsibility beyond their own borders. This may take the form of providing humanitarian aid or economic support. You need economic and military clout, a strong security presence, and you need to be engaged beyond your borders. Most of all, ladies and gentlemen, you need to show a willingness to act and to show initiative. None of these is possible without a good quality of governance, above all, effective leadership. Which brings me to my next point. For the world to become better equipped to tackle these challenges and crises, first and foremost, we must need, we need a renewed focus on dialogue and engagement. There should be greater effort to engage, emphasize points of common ground and build linkages in order to develop a better relationship which respects every, each other's sovereignty and integrity. Establishing reasons for countries to work together is the true uh, guarantor of peace and harmony. And we should use this moment at a time when we are united in facing a universal challenge to build these linkages and build these bridges. By this I mean we must do more to share personnel, equipment, R&D, and other procedures in how to handle pandemics. Countries which have learned from the experience of fighting SARS virus have important lessons to share with other countries and with the world at large. Ladies and gentlemen, no one has an exclusive on wisdom. Moreover, directing blame, threatening sanctions, and back blocking and tackling, these are not the answer to our current challenges. They may send a political signal domestically in the short term, but they will not bring 
lasting solutions to the global problems we face and will merely make it harder for us to work together and live together. However, we have been living through a period where we face a global crisis of cooperation. This has been largely with the growing tensions between the main economic and political superpowers, including the United States, uh, Russia, China, and the European Union. All the hearts of this issue, collapse, cooperation, has been a disappointingly weak United Nations, at the heart of it. For most of the last decade, this one substantive institution has been missing in action sometimes. It has repeatedly failed to lead the charge when crisis has broken out and successfully mediated conflict. In the current pandemic, the United Nations has played a role, but more could, be, could have been done and will be done, hopefully. And this is despite the fact that the United Nations can be a true force of good and has an important part to play in the world at large. In our country, Pakistan, we had an earthquake in 2005. And when I made the call to the Secretary General Kofi Annan at the time, he mobilized the entire machinery of the United Nations and other countries. And that became the core of our rehabilitation program. This was in 2005. Many of you helped us in that process. So I would acknowledge then that the UN really, with Secretary General Kofi Annan leading the charge, helped us get out of a very difficult situation. However, like many multilateral organizations and the Bretton Woods institutions created after the Second World War, there are certain parts of the structure of the United Nations which needs to be updated. And that's what Secretary General Kofi Annan was working on. He's no longer with us, but I hope that the UN will keep improving its effectiveness and what we are doing. <clears throat> The world, of course, has changed since then. It is time to bring equity into the system and consideration must be given to balance the structure. The permanent members of the Security Council, the P5, have to start working better together. And over the past few years, we have seen that major powers have been splintering and further moving away on major issues than they should have been. Without reform, to bring them today, up to date with the modern world, these organizations will simply not be able to step up to the crisis as we face today or will face in the future. So ladies and gentlemen, it is time in my humble view for the United Nations to show a bias for action even more than it has shown. It needs to be front and center in crisis like we are facing today, reaching out to countries that may be struggling with their response to the pandemics and the current medic medical issues which we face. For the UN to be effective, ladies and gentlemen, it should establish a clear menu of what comes under its umbrella. There must be areas which are global in nature, pandemics, border disputes, poverty reduction, social sector, and all other such issues which fall under UNESCO and other UN bodies. Once these rules are even more clearly defined, it will become easier for the organization to act in cases like the pandemics we face today. Ladies and gentlemen, the World Health Organization has a particularly important role to play in spreading information and dealing with the current crisis we face, and, and, and definitely in the development of a vaccine to face the pandemic we face. To be frank, neither of these uh, institutions which I've mentioned uh, have uh, done what could have been done, but now I can see that they are, the UN, excuse me, the UN is stepping up to do more and the WHO is very active and we need everybody to work together. In fact, Individual countries, NGOs, and private sector businesses have done more in some cases than our multilateral organizations have done. Basically, we have to help ourselves and get the best available from the world. While it is admirable of what has been done, it should not be the way 
things work in the future. I would say that we must improve the role of these major institutions and look, ask them to reform themselves, change. The world is changing and they have to keep moving. Don't look in the rearview mirrors, but look ahead. Once the peak of this pandemic is over, I believe we must set up a proactive, empowered disaster relief unit which can provide adequate and immediate attention around the world should this uh, type of pandemic happen again. This body would have expertise in, in all types of disasters from pandemics to floods to earthquakes, etc. It should be formed uh, under the auspices of the United Nations, which has the authority and capacity to help countries around the world and across borders. We must take an inclusive approach, ladies and gentlemen, which I believe will benefit all of us in the long run. What we must understand is that not all countries have all the specialists for every emergency. Not all have experts in pandemics and manufacturers that can produce the necessary equipment or labs which can develop a vaccine immediately. We must have a better system to enable success transfer. But that I mean, by that I mean that if a country has a good solution, it should immediately come to everybody else to share. If we had done this for Sure, time, Kaid, I really I want to I want to remind about the time limit. I'm really okay. sorry for that. Just so, to give no opportunity problem. for the rest of the speakers so, to, to have I'm time on as my well. last So ladies and gentlemen, what we have learned in this pandemic is this, though no country stands alone in such a large crisis. Even the most economically advanced countries have seen drastic shortages of personnel and equipment and various other requirements. You cannot silo yourself forever. Global cooperation is key and disaster management has to be a key effort. As the United Nations celebrates its 75th milestone, it must ask itself this, what is the place in today's world of the UN? Is it doing enough to tackle the current problem we face? Is it succeeding in its mission to be a unifying force and a, so, and a, co and a platform for increasing cooperation and peace? The harsh reality is, ladies and gentlemen, the UN must urgently step up to these uh, con challenges we face and so it becomes and remains relevant to the world. The pandemic should serve as a lesson to the world. We need to do more and be prepared for future such crises, whatever they may be. And investment in R&D and process management and all the challenges which we face will be required. The time of adapting to realities of today has come and to bring in an era of transformative change that time is now. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Th thank you very much. Um, I, I will ask uh, other speakers as well to, to um, confine the introduction to five minutes, maximum seven minutes, if it would be possible. It's very hard for me to intervene when the speech and introduction is uh, so interesting and eloquent. So please um, do that for the sake of me not to be put in the position when I have to do it. Uh, would, I will turn now to Mr. Bondevik now for the introduction and then just uh, to ask perhaps to take that angle from, uh, from Nordic countries, so to say, from Norway you come from. Uh, for a long period of time and up until now as well, uh, Norway, as much as Nordic countries as well, have been insulated in so, so many ways of many challenges uh, that uh, many in Europe faced when it comes to internal social cohesion, economic development related changes, uh, challenges even with relation to the migration and then refugee flows in that regard. So how the world uh, seems, uh, looks now from your perspective in that regard, where we are all moving and what are the main challenges that countries from, from north of Europe would uh, see uh, uh, pivotal now uh, for, for new normal to be shaped in the way that could lead for more peace and security in the future. Thank you, Madam Moderator. And um, we move from Pakistan up to the high north. 
Um, first of all, can you hear me and see me? All yes, of you? Uh, I hear you well. I'm trying to uh, find uh, you visually as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and I can I in, inform you that here up in the high north, uh, we have a, already a rather warm summer. So I'm here at my uh, summer house for a vacation, but it's a great pleasure to, to join this uh, web seminar. And as the moderator already pointed to, my background is from uh, Norwegian experience. Uh, we have the so-called Scandinavian uh, model. Um, Norway is a member of NATO that also contributes very much to our security, but we are not member of the European Union, but we cooperate very closely with them. Um, I myself founded uh, 15 years ago the Oslo Center, which um, works especially with democracy assistant projects around the world. And I'm also a member of Club de Madrid, which also is an organization of former presidents and prime ministers working for democracy. So this is my background. And I, I will bring in some perspective that, uh, of course, are influenced by this background. Let me start by uh, telling you about an experience I had when I was prime minister. I organized in cooperation with international or organizations a conference in New York about extremism and terror. And our conclusion was that extremism and terrorism, which is a threat to the world peace of today, primarily is fueled by many years of occupation and by humiliation. It is for me obvious that if uh, some are occupied for a long time, you sooner or later will get an uprise, uh, even violent. And it's also for me obvious that if a group people are feeling humiliated, they will also uh, create uh, an uprise. And uh, such humiliation can, for instance, come out of if a religion or if a culture is looked down upon as second class. And I think this is a challenge in the world of today. Maybe we could come back to it. Mm -hmm. I'm also convinced that lasting peace and also transition from ceasefire to peace depends on a real democracy and on inclusive societies. For me, these are two key words, democracy and inclusion. Uh, in authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, sooner or later you will have an uprise, probably also a violent one. We see this through history. It is consequently of great importance uh, to work on developing and stabilizing more democratic states all over the world uh, and to develop good governance and rule of law. And this is, as you all know, in accordance with uh, the UN developing uh, goals number 16, which is said by the UN itself is a precondition for all other goals. Over several years after 1990, we know that there was a substantial increase in number of democracies, not only in Eastern uh, Central Europe, but also in Africa and in Asia and Latin America. But unfortunately, over the last three, four years, there has been a fallback, a decrease of real democracies. And we have to address this uh, core challenge because this is also a threat for peace and for stability. In my view, there are uh, especially two important dimensions on how to save democracy and consequently peace and stability. Also after the COVID-19 pandemic now. First, uh, we have to build up strong political and democratic institutions that are sustainable and not depending only on a few strong political leaders in the country. And secondly, to create more inclusive societies where different groups, being political, religious, ethnic, culture, women and young people, where they feel included. So the civil society is consequently 
uh, of, of great importance and must be strengthened. When I'm traveling around for the Oslo Center for Club de Madrid, uh, we meet very often leaders in the political institutions, but there is a lack of civil societies in many countries. And then that creates a challenge for democracy because democracy is not only parliament, government, political parties, it's also about a lively civil society, non-governmental organizations and other frameworks. So that is uh, for me very important to emphasize. Let me also point to that we know from research that especially young people who feel to be exclu excluded from the society are those who most easily are recruited to extreme and terrorist groups. That is the case in Norway, and that is the case in other countries as well. So inclusion is consequently a key word. So it is a challenge how to build up frameworks where everybody can feel included. And this has to do with how we organize uh, local communities, non-governmental organizations, political parties, and, and so on. Let me just very briefly in, at the end um, address another uh, issue. Because during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, period, it has been raised, raised a debate about national <laughs> responsibility and uh, institutions on the one hand versus international cooperation and institutions on the other hand. What is the most important during such a crisis? In my view, it's no doubt that every nation has a responsibility to take every pre precaution step to be able to meet challenges as pandemics and other international crises. But we have also through this crisis experienced that we will not be able to do that without a stronger international cooperation. Strengthening, not weakening our global organizations and institutions. And in this regard, it was also interesting to hear Prime Minister Aziz from Pakistan uh, mentioning a possible disaster relief unit under the UN umbrella. We have, of course, the World Health Organization that should be such a uh, unit for, uh, for pandemics and other health, uh, global health issues. And we know that the US now withdrawing and weakening that institution, the opposite of what we need. Uh, but it's interesting also to discuss if we, we, we need other institutions. So these were some perspectives uh, from uh, my side uh, and from uh, Norway and uh, the so-called Scandinavian model. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a small uh, follow-up, perhaps provocative question. At the times like crisis where we are now, uh, where we frequently hear that COVID-19 as a pandemic acts as an accelerator for many things, perhaps now for the future development, could we say that it could accelerate both ways what will be the future of the UN, either accelerate the process of reform by highlighting that there is need for that, for the global action like that, or perhaps accelerate the final realization that it's broken. And then as it is, it can't actually meet the uh, challenges of tomorrow, uh, especially if we see that big actors like the US could be withdrawing more and more from being more actively engaged in actions related even to the uh, actions related to WHO. Something went wrong with the action, uh, uh, not only of WHO, but with the global action of that kind. So are we at the juncture when either it will be realized as broken or perhaps otherwise in a positive direction? Yes, uh, I think you are right. We are at a, a crossroad now. Uh, of course, I. I do hope the first, namely that one of the outcomes of the uh, pandemic is that all states acknowledge that we need to strengthen our already existing international organization, especially UN, of course, WHO and others, maybe also create new ones, new units. But I am afraid of the opposite, of course, 
that uh, you get a nationalistic tendency in several countries, uh, more or less closing the borders to others, say that we, we can manage to do this ourselves. Uh, we have to take care of ourselves, uh, not feel responsibility for the others. This is a real threat. So I think that uh, now the time when we hopefully will leave this pandemic is very crucial for the future of uh, the world and how it should be uh, organized. So I think all democratic and international uh, focused organizations and politicians and everybody should use this opportunity to emphasize the importance of strengthening international cooperation, not weakening it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Anna, uh, let me turn to you now. You are very well versed to the developments within the EU now. We see that EU has struggled in the beginning of the startup of the pandemic of coming up with its own action, but now it accelerates its response to it and is becoming uh, more of a strategic actor in that regard. The new concept of recovery is not, to my mind, an attempt of saving what the economy of the EU was, but building up the new cleaner in terms of the climate, cleaner economy. So what, what, what is your take on that? How much EU is able to pull up its uh, action together in that regard? Uh, as an uh, additional question, perhaps if I may add to what otherwise you were planning to say in your introduction as well. Very interesting perspective to hear on that as well. Uh, Madam moderator, I I understood that you are calling on me, that it's not yes. in order. Well, I will give a very short answer. Of course, I agree with many, many of the things that have been said, but I would pick up on the last words by uh, former Prime Minister of uh, Norway. I think that, uh, that we, we have the, the area of should be, of must be, Kelsenian must be, and then we have the reality. And if the reality is that multilateralism doesn't work and that refunding I, or just these ideas of having a new Bretton Woods conference and all that, this is pie in the sky. We have to be realistic. And I think that being realistic is uh, addressing uh, what we have and making it function without convening power, because uh, as it has been said, the United States is not where, nowhere to be seen, and there is no other convening power. But we need, we, we don't have to, uh, to accept a Hobbesian world of uh, each man for himself, which we have seen even in the European Union through the pandemic at the beginning. Even the internal market was gone. Everything was gone, each man for himself. I think that we have to take responsibility and build bottom up and on realism. Less ambitious, less design, less what you want, but realism. And in this realism, I will also pick up something that has been said, which is we need to convene uh, different, different actors, not just member states, but different actors. Today we see that in the, I mean, in the solving of the, the, the conundrum of the, of the vaccine, private actors will play a key role. NGOs will play a key role. Groups, these groups that were mentioned of women, young, we need to have a, a, uh, I mean, a more focused, more realistic cooperation. I hope we will recover convening power but it's not for today. And I think that we many times we, we invest too much time in saying what doesn't work and not saying how we can make things advance. And we can. And the Green Deal is, is a good example. There are others. And of course, the pandemic will bring us. Allow me to pick up one very interesting comment of our keynote speaker, the NPT. There, there is another area where we could, we should, the NPT and the P5. We know that there is a procrastination process there in the, re, in the revision of the NPT, but if, if we could, and this is a, this is a I mean, 
possibly or maybe a role for the Nizam Foundation to lobby the P5 so that they make a declaration, they, they, get, they get things moving on. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that is within this new approach of not top, top down but bottom up and not a big but you know practical and, and addressing concrete issues. The MPT is one fundamental issue where I think that much could be done if we could bring this to the attention of, uh, of the, because it's very technical, of the public opinion, it's very technical, but it is fundamental for the, the elements of peace and security. And thank you. I will leave it there. May I comment, thank you very on, much. The May I comment on the last uh, few words sure. that I heard? On, I just want to say that in the Israeli-Jordanian uh, peace treaty, and indeed, in all our conversations with um, the countries I referred to as Maverick, including Pakistan and India, we have always aspired to creating a Middle East or a, a conference for security and cooperation in our region. And that, of course, is uh, dependent on the stabilization politically of the situation uh, today. I mean, I have personally invited Indian and Pakistani interlocutors in this issue, and they have met in my country without any interference by the host country, and I think this is possible. But I think that the, the, the question of diplomacy has to be revisited, and that's why I'm rather enthusiastic about uh, a new Bretton Woods, which has been suggested today, and for that matter, a new Dumbarton Oaks, that uh, revisits the idea of regional responsibility uh, addressing power in the centers of the world, rather at developing a conversation about comprehensive security and justice, rather than continuing in this way of, of uh, favored status countries getting away with whatever they want to do. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, I'll turn now to President Emil Constantinescu. His uh, theme of the introduction is a natural follow-up to what has been said already when it comes to the possibilities of the uh, global governance in that regard and what could change in the institutions. In I'm sorry? Um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to meet you today uh, to celebrate uh, 75 years uh, since the creation of the United Nations Organizations. Uh, I would like to talk to you uh, today uh, about uh, peace, the bedrock of global governance. Uh, our panel uh, proposes a fitting theme for a celebration of United Nations, uh, namely, uh, how can war be transformed uh, uh, into peace? Uh, the uh, UN was created several months after the end of World War II, the greatest human catastrophe in the history of mankind. And uh, without a doubt, its greatest achievement over its uh, 75 years of existence has been a successful prevention of another uh, uh, global um, uh, conflagration. The current pandemic has brutally returned uh, the interesting value of life to the attention of our globalized society and serve as a reminder to us that this lengthy and laudably world peace has not, however, prevented unnecessary bloodshed and loss of life through regional, local, or civil wars or due to repressive tactics employed by dictatorial regimes which over a much longer period uh, came to surpass the death toll of the Second World War altogether. It uh, no less true that the spread of democracy worldwide, a cause uh, championed by the United Nations itself, has served to diminish the occurrence of the uh, aforementioned types of repression which have uh, since been legally ratified as uh, crimes against humanity. But just as the International Criminal Court has become a useful instrument in uh, sanctioning uh, such transgressions. 
<clears throat> eradicating warfare altogether requires that uh, it be defined through international legislation as, in essence, a crime en masse. And only afterwards can discussion be opened on the mitigating and aggravating circumstances of those who will it. To clarify, the criminal nature of war is a way to print, uh, print it in its many modern guises, regional, local, hybrid wars, or the globalization of terrorism, which flourished by using the investment on information technology uh, and social uh, networking. Eliminating warfare as an acceptable means of conflict resolution necessitates a profound transmutation of human consciousness that the current political, military, and financial establishment cannot adequately address. And uh, uh, here, I believe, is where uh, international organizations such as the United States, uh, United Nations, and its uh, affiliates can play an active and essential role. Uh, contemporary society is uh, beset uh, by active and frozen conflicts whose underlying causes uh, stem from residual differences in the mentalities and collective psychologies of historically opposed nations, ethnic or religious groups uh, made manifest in uh, the expressing of uh, historical frustrations. Classical uh, diplomacy focusing um, on nation states based on external political, military, and economic pressure might be capable of containing this frustration for a time, but cannot ultimately prevent their conflagration in various moments of crisis when um, such differences are weaponized by political actors to provoke emotional shocks a mean to delete uh, civil discontent aimed uh, at economic and social issues towards uh, ethnic or religious uh, grouping identified as hostile. Uh, cultural diplomacy can act uh, as a preventive mechanism against uh, the bellicose internal and external policies of uh, the serially guilty. It begins with a dialogue based on uh, accepting the other, but can only be truly fulfilled through thoroughly understanding the other. It's the admission that there is much to be learned from a culture uh, alone uh, to one's own. <clears throat> Such dialogues serve as a potent tool indeed Yet a lasting peace cannot be edified without the parallel creation of a true culture of peace. In order to impart this concept its appropriate weight, a peace must not be viewed merely as an alternative to war. It must not be considered a value unto itself but an instrument in defense of humanity, greatest treasure of all, life. A culture of peace is only achieved through an extensive educational process that rejects violence, not only in the resolution of military, political, and economic differences, but also as an avenue for the attainment of universally desirable values such as freedom, truth, and justice. A human society has at present reached an uh, evolutionary, uh, therefore, the, where the space for democratic dialogue uh, has substantially increased uh, to the detriment of authoritarian regimes, to the extent uh, that the institution of fundamental moral values at a global level might well be achieved peacefully. Unfortunately, children and the youth are continuously assaulted by a large-scale propagation of violence 
through cinematography, television, the media and social networks, which have proven to be uh, fecund environments for the orchestration of hate. We should consider why is it the history of mankind has uh, for millennia uh, been a history of uh, wars instead of history of civilization? And why the heroes of society are the lords of war and not the lords of peace? The culture of peace is not a short-term remedy, but rather a long road through darkness uh, onto light, which can only be navigated by way a lengthy and complex educational program from childhood until old age. We must be fully and concretely implemented, not just in schools, but in society at large, and which must uh, ultimately be internalized by each of us in turn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's very uh, merited that you've highlighted the issue of education because ultimately any uh, sustainable uh, transformation, uh, societal <clears throat> transformation, uh, nationally or internationally, is heavily dependent on education and education in such a way that value-based education is becoming part of how we raise the future generations and something that uh, we uh, feel that uh, in many countries in Europe as well uh, has been forgotten because uh, it has become an understanding that it's granted, it's given, that we all understand that, the values, the benefits of it, uh, but uh, apparently uh, throughout all these wars of disinformation lately and then a uh, rise of the populism, uh, polarization of our societies, we see that it's not the case. It's a common effort and constant effort that needs to be driven in this direction so that we see that both rights and responsibilities are always well understood when it comes to our societies. And education means education of citizens as well as the future citizens. It's not just individual approach to the education only from the perspective of knowledge and skill sets that it has become in many ways recently in our educational systems. I'll uh, turn to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Herman de Groot. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry I have to remind again speakers about the time which we limits uh, time of which has is becoming even more <laughs> limited than it was in the beginning. I'm sorry for that Herman. Thank you very much. Uh, you may interrupt me when I'm too long. Most of us have uh, had the time to read, to listen, to call, to have a contact worldwide in those almost three months and uh, I was 52 years elected in Parliament, so I could have a good contact with a lot of feelings. And in a certain sense, we have to utilize this crisis uh, at this moment and those coming months. There is no human being, I suppose, knowing better the words of COVID or Corona as what happens in the last months. And we saw that a lot of human defaults were appearing. And I would just try to put two words. There is fear and there is hope. Fear, we are afraid to be reached by the disease. We don't understand that going to any planet almost outside universe, we can solve a pandemic which was unexpected and we can save lives and reorganize ourselves that fear has conducted to a kind of nationalistic reflex. Even institutions as United States, uh, European Union, United Nations could never respond. The best organized international uh, association would be uh, this European Union, did not have any power or less power in that kind of impact. So we saw nationalistic reflex, not only by countries, but by regions, by cities. If you go to Nigeria, if you go to China, if you go to the United States, if you go to Europe, if you go to countries inside Europe, if you go to, to regions in Italy, if you go to regions in Germany, we have this kind of egoistic reflection from fear. How can we survive what happens to us unforeseen 
this kind of SOS save our souls is supporting regimes, democratic ones or non-democratic ones. And in fact, it could be a setback, a setback to solidarity, except if we can translate the word fear to other fields. If you are afraid to die by virus in a hospital without respiratory instruments, you could die also very fast dramatically by civil war in camps, in refugees, among the 80 million people living outside their countries in despair and misery. So fear to be protected yourself, to be protected to the governments, through the institutions, to find in a certain sense, a protection in that new concept of localization versus globalization. Be very careful about the localization, which means we have to do it local, we have to produce local, we have to defend ourselves local, we have to keep our vaccine local, we have to keep our medication local, is a very danger, which is in a certain sense uh, in the future, a handicap. But if you transpose this fear for this disease, for this pandemia, to the fear we have to have on injustice, on war, on terrorism, it could be a positive element for the future. Second concept that I saw and read is hope. Hope has to be international. There is no limitation, no boundary, no regime. There is no propaganda. There is no defense of democracy of anything which can stop a virus. So this hope is to be in solidarity. Can the hope not be translated in a comparable solidarity to try to avoid other viruses? Those are poverty, misery, corruption, exploitation. You know, uh, I'm very great contacts in Africa. Africa will be one third of the world population in very soon. We'll have the youngest age uh, is a divided, split, miserable part of the world in the great factors as the reaction of colonialism of anything you could imagine exploitation by richer countries of, of elements of uh, uh, farming mines you can all cite them we feel at the same time that we could transpose fear and hope to what is the important thing how to reach peace worldwide and i think that that we have to find an organism could be a wise man or a wise women committee, could be an ad hoc group, it could be a think tank, it could be something which could react now immediately. Knowing that psychology, and Prime Minister of uh, Norway was saying that the oppression, the, the disconsideration, uh, this kind of hate, which is a research to identity and to define my identity towards the lack of identity of somebody else. Why could we not think? together or institution because the united nations were not equipped to do that europe was not equipped to do that can we think with experts with politicians with, with sociologists i don't care how to utilize this drama this impact of fear on any individual person personally fear fear not to survive fear to go to a hospital fear not to come back from those hospitals with the same hope, can, can science, can people, can responsible people, not in a world so equipped, so uh, I would say helped by artificial intelligence, capable to send uh, satellites anywhere around the universe, where is the lack of putting together? And we are responsible in our lack of capacity to make positive the fear and to make practical the hope. And if you could think about that, if you could try to have these motives as a kind of action, we, I think, would have a great service to humanity. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Herman. Uh, I think one of the biggest tests through which we have to go, hopefully soon rather than later, when the vaccine ultimately will hopefully come on the market, how much it will be treated as a global commodity rather than a subject of competitive access uh, by, by those who will have more privileged access to it. So the test of whether or not we are able to uh, 
kind of global action of turning this moment of fear into the hope. This could be one of the testing grounds, obviously, in, in the nearest so. future, I, I hope, so, rather, right. than, rather, than, uh, rather than later. Mm -hmm. By will, combining fear uh, and hope into the in vaccine, sorry, just by combining these two elements, sure. because we say so many interesting things, to say that the vaccine could defeat fear. And vaccine could at the same time create hope. We have instruments to change mentalities of leaders and people. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, Mladen Ivanich, I'll turn to you now. You come from a, a country uh, which has gone through so much uh, in the recent history. Many issues that we've talked now have been part of your lifetime uh, experience. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, you are in Europe, but you're not part of European Union either. I feel many resemblances in that regard from where I come from as well. And uh, would be particularly interesting to hear your perspective on issues that we've talked now. Uh, as an example of what we see now in the EU mobilization of huge funds of liquidity, so to say, for recovery of the economy and building new strategic perspective of economic recovery. It's a great benefit to have access to that when you're part of the European Union, if the, if the decisions of that kind will be formalized. But how countries are dealing with the situations of such an economic downturn above all that we're challenging already at the times when future is much more uncertain than it was. If you could touch some of that as well, could be, I guess, very interesting for our viewers. Thank you very much. It's good to see all the famous faces and the friends. And I hope that relatively soon we will pass this corona crisis and hope to see you without, I don't like the word social distances, but without the physical, physical distances, because I, 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 I would very much like to see you again somewhere in the future. I also would like to thank Nizami Gajavi International Center for organizing this panel. Yes, I am coming from Bosnia. Bosnia was full of the uh, different challenges in the past, and I was, I am coming from the country which was faced with a very difficult war. And uh, this November, we will celebrate 25 years of peace. And there are some lessons, at least lessons for me, maybe it can be useful for some others, learned in Bosnia. In order to have sustainable peace, there are some preconditions. First precondition is that solution has to be somewhere in between extreme positions of the sides who are involved in the conflict. First, there cannot be a winner in any conflict, because if you have a winner, then that means that you have a loser. And the loser will always wait for the second half of the game trying to be a winner, if it's possible. So the solution has to be somewhere in between. In order to have this solution to really be implemented in the real life, you have to have readiness of the sides involved in the conflict uh, to achieve the peace. The reasons for that can be different. One can be that they are tired of the conflict. Second, that they cannot, that they finally realize that they cannot achieve the, 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 the real goal, the biggest goal. But the local players involved in the conflict, they have to be ready to implement the solution. That's the second precondition. And in order to have first solution, which is in between, and second, local players be ready to achieve the peace, you have to have uh, agreement of the big players, global players uh, involved in the conflict. I think that the Bosnian case, the peace which was achieved in Bosnia, is one of the last when we had on the same, on the board, together on the board, United States, Russia, European Union. I cannot remember uh, any case where all these three players but on the same side after the Bosnian case. And in the current world, I am really worried that we don't have that precondition. Unfortunately, if you see Middle East, if you see the Syria, if you see the Libya, 
there is no agreement among the key big worldwide players. And uh, I am very much worried that uh, with the current leadership in all these countries, that we can have a conditions uh, to have a common view on any crisis in the world, even including COVID, which is very worried. And I agree with Madame Palacio that this is the real challenge now. And globally, there are, I think, three ideological approaches uh, about the global governance. One is globalization, which was uh, accepted as long as we had a single strong player, meaning United States. Now we are faced with a second potential ideological so-called sovereignty with its own problem without having a global opinion. And the third one is multilateral approach, multilateralism. I very much advocate for the third approach. I don't see any other solution. Uh, I, I really believe that all these challenges which we are faced with, like wars, civil wars, conflicts, regional conflicts, COVID even, cannot be solved without, without multilateral approach without having all the countries together. Unfortunately, I am very worried that with the current leaders, the main players are not ready to deal with these problems. And because of that, I expect that, I don't see any, any, any place where we can expect quick solution because of the lack of the common approach of the big players. Uh, we have very selfish approach within the United States. We know what is the situation in the Russia. Now we see that there are problems with uh, uh, that China is basically a challenge for the other big players, and that there is a lack of the even instrument mechanisms how to come and to sit together and to have some sort of the common common approach. And because of that, I I really believe. Uh, that current leaderships are, are not ready to make a new general deal, and that there is a need some, for something which happened in uh, '68 in the last year, some global movement from the youth, from the intellectuals, which will make a pressure on the leaders to have more common approach to emphasize the role of the United States, or the United Nations, because I don't see any other, any other way of being together. All these big meetings of the G20, G8, uh, G, I don't know how many, uh, they didn't work. And the only place where it could work is uh, basically UN. One of the leading player can be after solving its own problem, you, uh, EU, because EU is by definition multilateral institution. And EU has to play a very significant role in that. And I hope that they will take that responsibility because the others, uh, the, other, the other big players, uh, they somehow need some sort of the conflicts always somewhere there in order to be really important. And without the common approach, I don't see uh, solutions including uh, including the COVID. That was just a short, short comment on the on on the Absolutely. on the issue. Uh, Mladen, just very short follow up question from my side. You uh, with the new commission has declared that it will be a more geopolitical commission. Is it an expectation from where you come from that it could mean primarily, or you would expect at least that it would be more of a geopolitical EU in its own neighborhood to begin with? Uh, rather than globally only? You know, the first feeling after having the new European Commission is that they are a little bit more serious about the Southeastern Europe, Western Balkan especially, uh, than the previous one. The previous one started the mandate with a very clear message, there will be no enlargement, which was very, de very depressive at that time. The new one started with a much more optimistic and the positive approach. But will that be reality? I still don't know. I am still a little bit cautious in having the final expectation. Hope that it will be more positive, more 
uh, not in a wording, but in real life, in the real activities, because that would be extremely important for the for the uh, Western Balkans, and uh, especially for the Western Balkans, but then also the, for the Caucasus countries. Also, it's uh, extremely important to have very active, very clear, and less bureaucratic approach. I, I really believe that if EU wants to play a more positive global role, uh, these two areas are the key uh, to show in the real life that this is their intention and that the EU is able to do something like that. And that will be a big test for the, for the new commission. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, Mrs. Palacio, uh, I, I wanted to make sure that uh, I called you earlier during the, the, the uh, speaking of the speakers so that to make sure that I'm not omitting, I'm not, I'm giving you the opportunity to say what you wanted to say. Is there anything that you would want to add? Your microphone I is muted. I just yeah. want to say thank you. It has been a great opportunity. I have listened to fantastic interventions and I hope that uh, we repeat this and I know that you have still one speaker that hasn't speak and we are getting uh, late so just let me stay here. Thank you very much. I think uh, I want to make sure with Robson then that since Boris is not able to participate today do we have one more speaker that needs to participate? Uh, no, we don't have any more speaker. I'm sorry? We don't have any more speaker. Oh okay. 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 Well, uh, allow I, me to react. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, there are so many things that have been said, but I I think that there are two issues here. Uh, what can we do? Just what can we do? And there, I will uh, pick up what Herman de Croo said. I think that we have to analyze how to turn around this fearful position where we are that is paralyzing, that has brought an inward looking. Second, and related to that, we, and this has come across many of the interventions, this idea of citizenship. We see too much polarization in the two extremes, and we see too much of this relationship with the authorities of just a consumer versus service provider. And, and we need to revive this idea of responsibility because in part, our, our issues in the global governance is that, okay, you know, uh, we don't have the convening power. I fully agree it has been said. I think it was uh, Prime Minister Marlik that, that said that the only convening power that could be uh, is United States, but not the present United States that are not interested. So we, are, we have the, that on the table, but we need, to, um, we need to try to just overcome this situation. And I think that there is a beauty of the role that NGOs and think tanks and the, the role that, that the Nazami Foundation plays. Because as, the, as our uh, keynote speaker said, I mean, this brings two regions that are, that have been uh, fundamental, uh, fundamental belts, fundamental uh, thriving, uh, and that at the same time, because they are many times being perceived between two, two, um, two, uh, two geographies, I would say. And I, th I think that uh, the Nazami, and this is why I'm so honored to be part of it, just brings the attention to this just this connection between the appendix of Europe and the Middle East and Central and Eastern uh, European countries. And just what is Eurasia, which is a big, big area there. So, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, I, I, don't want to, I don't intend to have a, a long summary from my side of so many interesting issues that have been raised, but one can easily say that uh, it is a common understanding that many of us have that we are indeed at the point of juncture, so to speak. 
as a crossroad in which we have to see what the new normal will emerge. But if we wait and see only what it will be, then it will be a very passive approach from our side just to wait what the future will hold for us, but rather to have a proactive position in the ways that in whichever ways we can contribute to shaping the new normal that could be indeed inclusive, uh, bringing peace and stability to the larger part of the world, if not globally, and that's exactly what is needed right now. So the role of the center in that regard is very important. I'm very pleased for a number of years already to be a very active part of it. And um, in this regard, uh, all of the actions that have been uh, done very actively by the center, including with uh, global calls for the action, uh, very, very much appreciated, I guess, not only within the center, but within the larger communities. Uh, before we end, and the line time is very limited right now, I want to invite uh, you, if you have uh, other speakers, and His Excellency, the key speaker as well, with any summarizing, concluding remarks as well. Uh, so please let me know if you are willing to do so, and then the floor is yours. Uh, Your Excellency, if you want to have a few words, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours, and then I could turn with other speakers as well for short concluding remarks if you are willing to do so. First of all, I'd like to say on the 25th uh, uh, of uh, or the 26th of uh, the month, 1945, 19 Arabs participated, uh, Palestinians, Lebanese, Iraqis, Syrians, and uh, an Iranian Syrian uh, in the uh, uh, establishing of the United Nations all of them graduates of the American University of Beirut. So 75 years ago, 19 of a total of 50 participants, 50 nations were Arabs. I say this because of the emphasis that some of you have brought on cultural relations. And I would like to say that um, we are always working against something, whether it's against COVID or against terrorism, but I think that the emphasis that you have placed on the importance of struggling towards achieving a template of hope, for example, is uh, uh, reminiscent of the fact that quite recently uh, we spoke of infosphere and terror sphere. Uh, I would like to say that in terms of um, the ecosystem, we are living a situation of ecocide. And uh, if you would uh, look at the social system, I think there is a danger of sociocide because we are becoming more antisocial. And one of you said uh, physical distancing is more appropriate than uh, social distancing. Years ago, I was asked by Yehudi Menuhin and Walter Zizuru, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, can we establish together a parliament of cultures, which we did for a few short years in Turkey but we do not have the ability to continue financially. And that's another problem, of course, values on the one side and materialism on the other. But it was very useful for me to meet people from the, uh, what you call the Western Balkans, uh, the Black Sea region, and all the way up to the Baltics, which is another region that we didn't describe. We always talk about East, West, or North, South. But in terms of uh, uh, regions that are struggling and surviving, I had the privilege of uh, witnessing uh, uh, the uh, visit uh, with an Israeli minister, Yossi Sarid, to uh, uh, Sarajevo. At the time, we had uh, 15,000 Jordanian peacekeepers. And I was asked to chair a conference, not unlike this one. It was a Croat minister, a Bosniak minister, uh, a Serb minister, an Israeli minister. And they were all in the mentality of the status quo anti, A-N-T-E. They couldn't talk to each other because of this, the, the prohibitions of the uh, aftermath of the Second World War. Today, when we say status quo, the status quo is the weak against the powerful. And I would like to suggest that we start building a new status quo, once again with emphasis on the United Nations, by all means, but in terms of the, Europe, the Commission for Europe and the Commission for Asia, the Economic and Social Commission for West Asia, it, we have to build our future in partnership as that uh, 17th goal of the SDGs suggested. We can only achieve stability in partnership and at all levels. 
as uh, one of you very uh, uh, rightly pointed out. So I thank you all for giving me the opportunity. I am at your service uh, so long as we're all at the service of the public good. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, please uh, raise your hand. It, it's very difficult to moderate it with the Zoom in a way. I don't see you here with me so that I, I can't really feel uh, intentions in that sense from, from the speakers, if anybody would want to intervene. But if any of you would want to say concluding uh, a sentence or two, please, uh, we could still devote uh, five minutes or so for that. So let me know. Please, please, Magna. Hello, yes, uh, yeah. Mr. Van Derwijk from Norway. Um, first of all, I think it has been a lively and, and a good uh, discussion. Uh, many interesting perspectives brought into the debate. So thank you for that. Uh, I will also emphasize that COVID-19 has really shown us how we depend on each other in this, uh, our global community. There were no borders for, uh, for this pandemic. And we see it also with other crises like uh, terrorism, climate change. Uh, there are no real borders and uh, consequently we depend on a stronger international cooperation, uh, no doubt. So after this pandemic, we have to discuss further how to organize our international community in order to strengthen it to meet new challenges. Because one thing is for sure, we will meet new challenges of one or another type. So that must be a main uh, issue after this uh, pandemic. A second point uh, in conclusion should be that we all agree that wars and conflicts are a waste of resources. Think about if we could use these resources instead on weapons and conflicts and war, uh, could use them uh, for uh, uh, solving our main challenges. It's a tragic what is going on in Yemen, what is going on, on in Syria, and some other places. So um, we should raise an international opinion to stop these wars, to have a ceasefire, but of course to bring it further as we have discussed here for a lasting, uh, lasting peace. So we have huge challenges ahead of us and I want to thank you for, uh, for, uh, for this uh, interesting uh, discussion and dialogue today and thank you also so much uh, to the moderator for helping us mm -hmm. through. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. President, Emil Konstantinescu, you, you, you had your hand raised. Yeah. Uh, for, for a long uh, while already, the international organization like uh, the United Nations, UNESCO, or the civil society, they try to create a political culture of security through negotiation and uh, cooperation. In order to promote peace and understanding uh, throughout the world, we are looking for the lowest common denominator, on which everybody can agree. Uh, it is a right and uh, welcome step, especially encountering the close threats. My opinion is that we should plan for more. If you want to make a real peace and understanding between people, we must focus to identify not the lowest common denominator, but we should relate ourselves to the highest common denominator uh, face. Um, my friend uh, Vladimir Ivanovich uh, experienced um, the drama uh, of the Bosnia Herzegovina war, where three religion, religion faiths uh, coexist. It is a high time for churches to come back to the fundamental goal of religion, peace. This is because all religions condemn war and consider the killing of the human being to be a capital uh, sin. Within the Levant Initiative um, uh, for Global Peace uh, project that the Institute for Advanced Study Work um, uh, Live and Culture and Civilization um, uh, that uh, was launched years ago. We have managed to bring together uh, spiritual 
leaders of, of all faiths. Such a common uh, message can be decisive in preventing the use of religion for uh, fueling uh, uh, conflicts. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, all of you uh, for your participation, for your thoughts, opinions, openness to share them. I want to thank Secretariat of Nizami Gonzavid Center and then the center in itself for organizing the series of the panels and panel discussion of today. And I hope that we emerge from the times where we are now in the, in, in, in the situation when the social contract nationally that we or internationally will be revalidated will be firm and will be underpinning the understanding of common purpose, common goal of either nationally in our nations and then internationally as well, so that it serves uh, the common purpose, it serves the common uh, good and uh, stability and then peace in the future. And inclusiveness, as many of you have mentioned today, will be key for that, so that we understand that politics work for the people, governments work for the people, uh, economy works for the people, and ultimately international institutions embody the values which bring uh, not only prosperity for the people, but then justice and fairness in the way that could be the foundation for the peace and stability at the end of the day. Um, I thank you all once again, uh, and uh, may I, I to thank, you. May I so, thank you. Yes. <laughs> may oh, we all <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, and thank uh, Nizami Ganjawi for standing up for the values about uh, which we uh, spoke of life and uh, the uh, survival of future generations. The Prophet of Islam said that if the day of judgment comes and you have a fruit-bearing sapling in your hand, plant it anyway. And that basically brings us back to thought. I would be terrified to think that a day comes where we have not only the elimination of the cogito sphere, the ability to think together, but cogito side, mm -hmm. that we are only allowed to think what is fed to us bilaterally by diktat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I wish you all the, uh, to stay healthy, uh, safe, uh, have a nice day today, and to ho hope to meet you sometimes in the future without physical distancing uh, somewhere in, the, in, in physical presence. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.